Thank you and welcome to the Investor Alliance for Human Rights webinar on the 2020 Ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index. Since 2018, we have been hosting this event with Ranking Digital Rights or RDR, and we're very pleased to partner again with RDR for the third year running. During this webinar, we will share and discuss with the investor community how big tech companies like digital platforms and telecommunication companies are respecting and protecting people's rights to free expression and privacy. My name is Anita Dorrett, and I am the director with the Investor Alliance for Human Rights, an initiative of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility. The Investor Alliance is a coalition of global institutional investors that at its core promotes, supports, and enables responsible investment that is grounded in respect for people's fundamental rights. We have more than 170 institutional investor members across 18 countries, representing over 5.3 trillion in assets under management. Just a few logistic points before we get started. The first is that we're recording this webinar, which we will make available to all registrants after this session. The second is that you are all on mute at this time, but you will have an opportunity to ask questions of our amazing panel uh, later, later during the webinar. You can do this by typing your question into the Q&A box that you will see an a icon at the bottom of your screen. Please type the question into the Q&A box and not the chat box because the chat box will not be monitored. You can type your question at any time or at the time that we open up for Q&A, you can also virtually raise your hands and we will call on you to ask your questions because we're looking for as interactive a session as possible and really to encourage discussion with our panelists today. Technology has reconfigured every aspect of our lives, more so during this global pandemic than ever before. Look at us right now, we're all together today on this Zoom webinar as a result of the global innovation of technology and telecoms companies that have enabled economic growth and the fulfillment of human rights for millions of people around the world. But these same companies have also caused or contributed to human rights harms on individuals and societies as last month's attack in the US Capitol magnified. Next slide, please. The Ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index is an annual assessment and ranking of the world's most powerful technology and telecommunication companies. Holding these companies to account for their policies and practices that affect our rights to freedom of expression and privacy. In order for us as investors to carry out our own responsibility to respect human rights as required under international law and frameworks like the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, we need information on our portfolio companies. We need to know what our portfolio companies' human rights governance and policies are on their human rights due diligence processes and performance. And reports like the RDR Index provides important data and insights for investors as part of our investment management. To learn more today, we are very fortunate to have an excellent panel and you can see all, all, uh, all of us on the screen and thank you very, very much to our panelists for making time today for us to have this discussion. And to kick us off today, we will start with our two speakers from Ranking Digital Rights. Rebecca McKinnon is the founding director of Ranking Digital Rights, a research program at New America. She is also the co-founder of the citizen media network, Global Voices, serves on the board of directors of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and is a founding member of the Global Network Initiative. Between 1998 and 2004, Rebecca was CNN's bureau chief in Beijing and Tokyo. We also have with us Jan Ridzak, who is RDR's company engagement lead and research analyst. He holds a PhD in government and public policy from the University of Arizona, as well as an MA in modern languages from Marie Curie University in Poland. Prior to joining RDR, Jan worked as the Associate Director for Program at the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford University, where he analyzed global approaches to disinformation, new models of content and threats to human rights stemming from faulty deployment and regulation of technology. 
So really now, without any further delay, let me hand off to Rebecca and Jan and really looking forward to um, this great discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, and uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna um, uh, frame sort of some of the initial findings and then hand it over to Jan to get even uh, further into some details. So the, the Ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index is, is now the, the fifth um, index produced by RDR. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And uh, for 2020, um, we evaluated 14 digital platforms and 12 telcos. And you can see here on the map um, what the, the companies were and where they are headquartered. Um, and uh, rank them on 58 indicators um, uh, that uh, relate to how these uh, companies' policies and practices affect freedom of expression and privacy of their users. Um, and we also included in this uh, new index, the 2020 index, some a number of new indicators that address targeted advertising and algorithms, um, aspects of many companies business models um, that uh, have, have clear impact on human rights in a number of ways um, that required addressing um, you know, that hadn't been as, as much as they needed to be in our original methodology. So, so this is the first year to use those indicators. And I, I know that there's quite a bit of interest among a number of investors about that. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the overall ranking, the, the, the total score when you wrap up all the uh, indicators. Um, and uh, I know for most investors, what's really interesting is the scores on the individual indicators. And we'll get into that in a moment. But uh, Twitter did come out on, on top, although as you see, with just barely over 50%. Uh, so really, everybody uh, is, is failing to disclose enough about their policies and practices that affect users' rights at this point. Uh, also this year for the first time, we added uh, two more platforms, Alibaba and Amazon. Um, it will be of note to investors given the extent to which uh, Amazon is propping up many portfolios that Amazon ranked dead last behind our Chinese and Russian companies. Next slide, please. Oh, and uh, I should actually, if we could go back to that slide, I also want to note, since we have um, uh, a, a colleague from Telefonica um, in the webinar today, that Telefonica for the second uh, time uh, in the index has uh, ranked at the top of, of the telcos, um, where we have a, a, a set of, of global, um, uh, globally represented uh, telcos in the mix. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we evaluating? We have three categories, governance, freedom of expression, and privacy. And I'll drill down a little bit more on governance in a minute, but I, I want to just explain what we cover in freedom of expression and privacy, because there is sometimes a bit of a misunderstanding. People say, oh, you're evaluating companies on freedom of expression. Does that mean whoever has the, best, the biggest free for all gets the highest score? Uh, and, and our answer is no. Uh, freedom of expression and information as defined uh, by Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not about you can do any, you're free to do anything you, you want without consequence, right? Uh, freedom in the context of, of human rights um, it involves uh, limitations on one particular right when it is being exercised at the expense of others. So we do expect governance. We are not expecting a state of nature on these platforms. We are expecting governance, but we're expecting governance that is human rights consistent. So we want to see that companies have policies uh, that are open and transparent. It's clear to users what the rules are. We expect that platforms will have rules, um, but that the, the rules are clear that they're developed in accordance uh, with, with human rights standards and in consultation with affected stakeholders, and that the companies be transparent about how these, these rules are enforced. We're expecting that there be transparency about how the company responds to government as well as private demands to restrict content or restrict access to service. We want transparency also around how algorithms are shaping what people see and don't see, as well as how people are targeted by particular content. We also look at identity policies 
uh, as well as network management and shutdowns. Um, so next slide, please. Privacy, we really look at three different uh, buckets of things. One is the, the collection and handling of, of user information. So uh, we want to see clarity to, to users and stakeholders about what is collected, for what purpose, uh, with whom it's shared, how it is used, and that users should have control over uh, and insight into, not only insight, but also control over that and have choice. Uh, we want to see a transparency around, uh, again, demands. Who, who has the ability to demand access to user information? Um, under what circumstances? So people understand how uh, their, their rights may be restricted uh, in terms of law enforcement, uh, surveillance, and so on. We also want to see that uh, the companies are providing evidence of robust security practices. So when it comes to data breaches, uh, are users being informed? Are companies um, conducting robust security audits, um, et cetera? We, we want to see evidence that, that users' security um, is uh, being placed at the forefront and that there are, is clear governance around that and oversight. Next slide, please. So speaking of governance, um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the governance indicators, which are always of great interest to investors, and then I'll hand over to Jan. So we have a number of, of governance indicators, kind of six overarching indicators with sub indicators, and you can explore the website to, to look at the, the full data set. But what we're finding in the results is that while 60% um, of the companies we evaluated do actually now have a commitment to respect human rights, including freedom of expression and privacy. Um, when it comes to remedy, <laughs> effective remedy, um, there is much less implementation and due diligence, evidence that uh, uh, due diligence across the range of ways in which the business might affect human rights, even less, only, only 12%. Next slide. So drilling down, uh, these, this is the, the, the score, this is the, the breakdown when it comes to just the governance indicators. And you'll see uh, Twitter, while it was at the top of the overall ranking, uh, performs less well um, on governance. Microsoft is at the top um, and Amazon uh, performing quite poorly. Uh, and on the telco side, again, you'll see Telefonica uh, is, is, is ahead by, by quite some measure. Next slide, please. So uh, to drill down on a couple of specific governance indicators, um, this is our second governance indicator, which looks at whether senior leadership, ide ideally the board, so you only get full credit if there is board oversight over how policies and practices affect freedom of expression and information and privacy. I'll just note, uh, Amazon provided no evidence of such. Um, and uh, you'll, you can, again, go to the website and explore the data, but uh, given uh, the Amazon's power uh, over people's digital lives and its representation in people's portfolios, this is a concern. Next slide, please. On impact assessment, which I uh, flagged previously as a concern, um, this is uh, the first sub-indicator on um, due diligence and impact assessment. And one, when it comes to impact assessment related to government demands, uh, related to restriction of information that is in response to government demands or uh, handing over of, of user data, sharing of user data um, with uh, security and law enforcement agency and, and is our companies performing due diligence about you know, which, uh, 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 how, how they handle these, these demands and, and where they, they are going to expose their users to such demands. Um, these are, the, this is the type of due diligence that the Global Network Initiative um, focuses on. And you'll see that GNI companies perform uh, a lot better than everyone else. Uh, and you'll see there, I've, I've flagged Amazon as, as a particular concern there. Uh, next slide. When it comes to due diligence around um, ways that companies' businesses affect the human rights of users beyond government demands, there's a lot less evidence of any due diligence. 
You'll see here in the chart, I flag, flagged Amazon, Apple, and Google as providing no evidence of uh, uh, due diligence around how they enforce their own terms of service. And Telefonica uh, being the only telco that, that provides uh, such uh, analogous evidence. Next slide, please. When it comes to due diligence around the human rights impact of algorithmic systems, uh, you'll see again, um, I flagged, uh, uh, you know, once again, Amazon, nothing, Google, nothing, uh, again, a concern. Um, and uh, a little bit uh, by, uh, you know, four other uh, digital platforms. Uh, and and uh, this is where Telefonica really stood out. Um, and we can hear a bit more about that later. Next slide, please. Targeted advertising, the human rights impacts of targeted advertising have become quite clear, um, given that uh, people around the world are targeted with all kinds of messages based on data that's been collected to profile users. Um, uh, this is one of the drivers of disinformation and uh, also uh, extremism uh, in, in many parts of the world. There's been a great deal of research on that that we published previously. Facebook was the only company that, that, that showed any evidence of, of conducting any such due diligence in, in any context. Um, again, this is a concern given the nature of the business model. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now hand it over to Jan uh, who, who will talk a bit about some of the other findings, particularly in the context that we've just come through uh, an entire year of pandemic and infodemic, uh, and uh, also a year in which digital platforms have done quite well financially, um, telcos being more of a mixed picture, uh, searching for new business models. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Jan. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Anita, Nicole, um, and to the whole team at the Investor Alliance that made today uh, possible. We're, we're really excited and, and we appreciate the chance to share our insights. Um, so to start, I ask you to take a look at the photo that you see in front of you. Um, this photo was taken by Abid Bhatt, a Kashmiri photojournalist. Um, and it shows people who are queuing up for milk in Srinagar in Kashmir uh, during the pandemic. And to us, uh, this is a very powerful illustration of the fact that crises tend to overlap, um, and especially in a year where you know every local crisis was was kind of imbued with the specter of COVID-19. Um, and in a year like this, uh, it was especially critical to see responsible policies, responsible practices among companies who uh, aspired to be the stewards of our digital lives. Um, next slide, please. So the 2020 index allows us to uh, take a bit of a panoramic look, I would say, at what these policies and practices looked like in, in, in such a critical year. Um, and this is kind of a snapshot of four of the areas that I think are worthy of attention in this context. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, companies uh, this past year stepped up their use of algorithms in enforcing their policies. Um, and besides highlighting the importance of having uh, strong policies governing the use of algorithms, which as we know can have uh, many uh, deleterious effects. Um, this also threw companies weak mechanisms for providing remedy into sharp relief, which our data kind of bears out. Um, secondly, uh, network shutdowns. Uh, network shutdowns continued throughout 2020. Um, Access Now identified, I believe, 213 that took place in, last, in the last year alone. Uh, and that includes prominent shutdowns in places like India and Myanmar that are uh, more akin to sort of digital sieges that, lo that lasted for months. Um, and in the 2020 index, we saw some, uh, I would say, glacial progress among companies on this front, uh, but it was not nearly enough. Uh, we have many companies that, that habitually implement shutdown orders, uh, and they still say practically nothing about their policies and practices with regard to, uh, to receiving such orders. Um, Thirdly, uh, we see a tendency for companies to provide uh, their users with access to their data without control. So there's a slow improvement on uh, granting users access to the information that companies collect about them, but that also contrasts with very weak options for controlling uh, whether that data is collected, what is done with that data, and, and how it's processed. 
And finally, um, as Rebecca already uh, sort of intimated, uh, it is impossible to ignore that Amazon is, is scraping the bottom uh, of the index this year. Uh, Amazon is dead last. Uh, and this stands especially, I think, in, in, in stark contrast to um, Amazon's role as this e-commerce Goliath, right? Especially in a moment where uh, nearly 50 cents of every American dollar spent during the holidays, this past holiday season, went to Amazon as we all uh, hunkered down in our homes and switched to e-commerce instead of uh, physically uh, buying our the, the products that we needed for the holidays. Next slide, please. So on the topic of remedy, um, the UNGPs, I think, as, as many of you who are on this call know, are very clear that uh, companies have a responsibility to provide strong remedy mechanisms. Um, but the average scores on our remedy indicator, which asks whether uh, companies disclose a clear and predictable uh, remedy process, are just 25%. And notably, um, I would say that includes uh, this year remedy on content moderation decisions. And if you separate those out, uh, they are in a separate indicator, the companies scored even lower than 25%. And now if you ask what can happen to uh, users' rights to remedy in a crisis, uh, I think these charts, which uh, come from our essay about protecting human rights in crisis, uh, give a very sort of compelling response. Um, so this chart that you see before you uh, shows the number of appeals that were submitted to uh, Facebook and YouTube, those two platforms, worldwide uh, in the last quarter of 2019 and in Q1 of 2020. Um, it also shows the amount of content restored on appeal. Um, and if you look at that, this is, uh, if you are familiar with the, the transparency reporting of these two companies, these are pretty standard dynamics for these two platforms. Um, next slide, please. However, when COVID hit, um, both of these platforms sent their moderators home uh, and they also both ramped up the use of algorithms to uh, enforce their policies. The difference uh, was that Facebook virtually shuttered uh, its appeals process. So the number of appeals on Facebook went from an average of 10 million approximately to 200,000, which is 3% um, of the previous volume. Um, and contrast that with YouTube, which is uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, YouTube took down more videos uh, also through algorithmic processes, but it kept its appeals system open, um, having previously laid the groundwork uh, to keep that system open during the pandemic. So this is an especially sort of striking contrast for us and highlights the, the, the crucial role of Remedy uh, in, in this whole conversation. Next slide, please. So um, we've also seen uh, an improvement over the years in terms of how transparent companies are about restrictions on content and accounts. Uh, that improvement is uh, largely driven by the US companies to their credit. Uh, so more companies than ever before are starting to publish transparency reports about content and account removals, uh, especially uh, in terms of uh, violations to their own policies. However, um, there are still significant gaps in what companies are reporting. Um, so this year we saw uh, signs of improvement, but at the same time among the big, big platforms, we, uh, we also saw signs of stagnation. Um, companies are aggregating data, uh, they're aggregating data from different regions and on different restrictions in a way that, that uh, obscures the full view for their users as well as for researchers like us. Um, and secondly, we're also seeing a major gap between um, how specific companies are on what their policies are and their reporting uh, of data on how they enforce them. So uh, companies do publish policies. They're more and more complex, more and more uh, sort of detailed, uh, as you can see both on Facebook and Twitter, but that does not uh, sort of go hand in hand with increased reporting of data on the enforcement of those policies. Next slide, please. And next, uh, there is, of course, the issue of network shutdowns. Uh, so the telcos that we rank uh, operate in a total of 125 countries in the world, which means the vast majority of the world. Um, next slide, please. And uh, at least seven of the companies that we rank implemented shutdowns in uh, at least 11 countries in the world. Uh, some prominent examples include uh, Telenor uh, in Myanmar and Bharti Airtel, as well as Vodafone in, uh, in India. And of course, you can see this map on our on our website as well. Next slide, please. Now, um, in the index, uh, our findings reveal that companies are still largely falling short with regard to transparency on how they process shutdowns, uh, as well as their publication of data on those shutdown orders that they receive. Uh, so many companies 
make public statements. You know, they put out incidental tweets, but as we all know, tweets can be very fleeting. Um, they are impermanent. Uh, they can also be deleted or removed. So we, we want their process to be uh, distilled in policy rather than in a tweet. Um, and we found that although companies have improved over time in terms of uh, publishing commitments to push back, to, um, to publish data on orders they received, as well as those they complied with, so compliance rates, um, by and large, these uh, three key pieces of information are still not distilled in consistently in, in their policies. Um, and I would also like to sort of note that there's a high chance that topics like this will be a matter of priority for uh, the Biden administration, uh, given that it is increasingly focusing on human rights uh, around the world. So this is something to, to watch in the future for sure. Next slide, please. Um, now, in the midst of uh, crisis, uh, as our data has been you know, used to create these mobility maps to, to trace the transmission of the coronavirus, uh, privacy and in particular control uh, becomes especially uh, important. So uh, we know the business models of companies like Facebook, like Amazon are fueled by, uh, by these data flows. We know that telcos are increasingly relying on targeting in some form. Um, and then we also see signs of convergence between the, the worlds of digital platforms and the world of telcos. Um, as for example, Facebook uh, invests enormous resources into uh, telcos in places like India. Um, so we especially want companies to provide clear options for control over how data is used uh, for targeted advertising, but of course, for other purposes as well. Uh, however, uh, although more companies than ever are allowing users to access the uh, categories of data that they hold about them, they still don't publicly provide options to uh, control the collection of this data in the first place. Uh, this is again, as opposed to use because uh, control of, of uh, how data is used versus how data is collected or if data is collected are two completely different things. Um, we also see low transparency on uh, deleting, on options to delete the data that is collected and the same goes for inference. So we, we see very, very low transparency on, um, on data inference. And I think, you know, looking at this chart, it speaks volumes that the two great purveyors of user data, uh, Facebook and Amazon, are at the very bottom of this ranking uh, on user control, users control over their own information. Next slide, please. Then in the context of the pandemic, um, there, the failure to prioritize security uh, is also very alarming in our uh, view. Uh, so Amazon, as you can see, is the only company that scores zero on our security oversight indicators, which uh, or indicator, which looks at things like um, employee access to data and whether the company limits and monitors it. Um, and just yesterday, actually very serendipitous coincidence, uh, an article came out in Politico that underscores uh, our finding here, uh, where uh, whistleblowers uh, uh, who have previously worked at Amazon say that, uh, and this is a direct quote, data is at risk because Amazon has a poor grasp of what data it has where it is stored and who has access to it. Um, so the fact that our, the release of this data um, comes uh, you know, uh, sort of coincidentally with this, this article, which only serves to sort of reemphasize the, 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 the veracity of our findings, I think is very significant. Next slide, please. Um, and as you can see here, this is a comparison between Amazon and Alibaba, so two e-commerce giants. Um, and uh, I think the first thing that sort of jumps out is that these problems are not really confined to a single indicator. Um, if you compare Amazon with its e-commerce competitor, Alibaba, uh, both are flying low on multiple indicators, but Amazon is at the very bottom of the ranking, right? So it's scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, Amazon, if you sort of dig into the data and look through it, Amazon is last on five of the eight uh, indicators we have on user information. It is last on remedy. Uh, it is, it's last on, on uh, content and account restrictions to enforce terms of service, um, on government censorship demands, on data breaches, and I think on a couple of other indicators. So all of this uh, points to not just sort of individual problems that uh, require sort of individual interventions. It points to a systemic problem that is at the heart of, uh, of this company, but also sort of a, a very significant um, message that, that I think other companies should, should take as well. Um, Amazon has you know, a lot of areas in which it, it should improve simultaneously in the next year. And uh, we hope that our methodology is going to provide a sort of roadmap to that improvement. Next slide, please. Um, 
So this is just to sort of reemphasize that uh, Amazon is at the bottom overall, but it's also uh, second from the bottom in all three categories of the RDR index. So here you can see the freedom of expression scores and the privacy scores. Amazon is second from the bottom on both. Alibaba is slightly above Amazon in, in both cases, um, but this sort of just underscores the, 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 um, the overall findings on Amazon. Next slide, please. Just a quick word, since I think I'm running out of time, but um, a word on uh, on score changes. So as Rebecca mentioned, uh, changes to our methodology, especially on algorithms and on targeted advertising, have led to major score drops. Uh, I believe the average is five percentage points across all companies, um, even more uh, among the US platforms, uh, as well as among the, U the EU companies and other high scoring companies. It's not particularly surprising that higher scoring companies have been more affected. Um, than companies that uh, you know habitually score zero, uh, but still, this is a, a very significant uh, you know thing to keep in mind. And in terms of trends, um, most companies, as you can see in these charts, this is this is a chart uh, that uh, considers exclusively comparable indicators between the 2019 methodology and the 2020 methodology. Um, so if you just sort of limit your scope to to the comparable indicators, most companies have improved, with the exception of uh, small score drops for Google uh, among the digital platforms and for AT&T among the telcos. Um, but you can also see that the US platforms are very much stagnating. Um, so you see Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Twitter, all those companies are bringing up the rear uh, among the digital platforms. Google is the only digital platform that recorded a decline in its score. Um, and that was primarily due to a slight change in its policy on account termination as well as um, identity policy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the other trend uh, here is that uh, for a third year in a row, um, companies that are uh, headquartered outside of the US and outside of the EU are dominating the top of the chart. So, um, so you see here, Mail.ru is the most improved digital platform. Um, Baidu is in third place. Uh, MTN is by far the most improved uh, telco. And of course, there are stories behind all of these results. Um, but um, I think I'm running out of time to tell them. So perhaps in the Q&A, uh, we can get into it a little bit more. Okay, next slide, please. So where does this leave us? Um, what we have here and uh, what we have brought up with the results of the 2020 index makes it clear that we're dealing with 26 uh, failing students, I would say. And we're looking for the first student who will even get a D on our, our report card. Um, of course, you know there are there are differences between the companies. Many companies disclose a lot of uh, useful information. However, as Rebecca mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the baseline is very very low. So there's a full list of recommendations for companies in the link that you can see on the slide. Uh, but to us, our results are kind of a clarion call for companies to um, plug the gaps in their human rights record before the next crisis, looping back to the sort of um, focus of, the, of my part of this presentation. So we want companies to commit to robust uh, human rights governance. We want them to assess and to mitigate harms. Uh, don't be shy about looking within and state that they're assessing the human rights impacts of how they use algorithms, how they use targeting. We want them to disclose comprehensive information about how they shape and target content, um, how exactly data is accessed, how it's used, how it's shared, how it's restricted. Um, and we want them to give users meaningful control over all of this. Um, you know, human rights risks, I think, uh, especially on this call, this is an important note. Um, human rights risks are material risks. And uh, I think this will only get more obvious uh, as, we, as we move forward in 2021. Um, next slide, please. And this is the final slide. So we also want investors to be asking questions um, uh, that are connected to, to what I just said. Um, questions about oversight. Does the board have necessary have the necessary human rights expertise? Uh, that a proposition that you know uh, some large companies have vehemently opposed in the past uh, couple of years. Are due diligence frameworks robust, uh, and do they clearly encompass the deployment of automation? Um, and, and really, does the business model itself pose an inherent threat to users? Um, you know, we think that tech, the tech we know, has the potential to be better than the tech we don't. So um, I'd encourage everyone to explore our results and um, extract the causes that will help um, bring that reality about. Thank you.
Great, thanks for that, yeah, and, um, and you know, uh, lots of information for us to talk about and, you know, those, those uh, questions that you raised for investors, you know, we can definitely uh, look to discuss that more uh, during the Q&A. So, um, the, you know, the RDR index has provided uh, data and analysis that has supported investor engagement with ICT companies on digital rights, risks and impacts. The 2020 proxy season saw a record number of shareholder proposals highlighting serious social and governance risks that the US tech giants were failing to address. So we have with us today, Lauren Compare, the Director of Share Owner Engagement at Boston Common Asset Management. She has worked in the responsible industry, investment industry for almost 30 years and has 18 years of experience in global responsible investing. Lauren also sits on the board of the Global Network Initiative and so with her extensive experience and leadership, who better than Lauren to give us the investor perspective on how using RDR data has helped with company engagements and what challenges they have faced. So over to you, Lauren. Great, thanks. Can you hear me, Anita? Yes, yes we can. Okay, perfect. Um, I wanted to start by saying that, uh, I, I actually it'd be great if maybe you could, I don't know, go back to the slide with the photos. <laughs> um, but anyway, I think that's fine. Um, I think uh, I wanted to start out by saying that if I think about the the evolution and focus on human rights um, for investors, digital human rights uh, are really, I think, one of the most prominent human rights risks that investors have embedded in their portfolios. And I think that's for a few reasons, one of which um, the the, um, the 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 desire really to invest in in the latest and greatest uh, technology companies. Um, when I think about what investors are looking for, ICT companies need to adopt the same rigor and innovation to digital human rights that they do to innovation around technology services, especially around algorithms and targeted marketing. We've um, been asking companies for many years using the RDR findings to think about how to embed human rights across the value chain from the design phase to how a product is supposed to be used versus how potentially it can be used, and to whom they sell or partner with. Companies are obviously facing increasing uh, financial, reputational risks, regulatory risks um, in, in certain markets. And actually, in places even like Asia, um, there is an increasing uh, need. Uh, consumers are now desiring more control, um, more understanding of their user rights, and um, uh, definitely uh, wanting uh, the, the, the security or the surety that their data is, is, is secure. Uh, for us as, at Boston Common Asset Management, we use the RDR findings um, really as the place um, to understand the latest uh, state of play. And I, and I think the enhanced uh, methodology really does reflect um, not only current, but also emerging risks um, around human rights that investors face. As Anita um, highlighted, we've actually been using the RDR findings um, since 2018. We were part of the formalized engagement that um, the Alliance um, uh, had in place, including uh, an investor statement. And we've had conversations with not only the, the US companies on the, on the index findings, but also um, international companies, including some of our Asian holdings. And uh, as, uh, as um, both Jan and Rebecca indicated, actually we're seeing uh, more progress um, over the last uh, iteration in, with some of those Asian, Asian holdings. I think, um, you know, we, we would also highlight the fact that we think it's important um, that the U.S. companies accelerate um, the rate of change in transparency, um, especially uh, related to algorithms and targeted marketing, um, how user uh, that is accessed, used and shared, and, and frankly, a big focus on, on user control. If I was gonna have a call to action to investors, because I, I know that Jan went through already um, what we need to see from companies, I would really like to see investors um, start using uh, the information as an input into their ESG um, frameworks, into their ESG analysis and, and, uh, and uh, um, eco kind of uh, setting um, in terms of their ESG integration processes. Uh, I'd like to see investors um, robustly use um, and engage companies on the gaps um, that were highlighted, especially around, uh, uh, you know, transparency, um, for example, on enforcement mechanisms, 
enhanced uh, human rights due diligence and, and digital uh, human rights uh, impact assessments. And finally, um, I, I would encourage um, both RDR and others um, to look at how the findings could be more formally integrated into ESG ratings platforms um, and service providers like Bloomberg. I think um, we need to see more of this kind of differentiated information um, be able to be integrated into um, platforms like Bloomberg. Um, finally, I'll just highlight the fact that we are going to be launching a formal collaborative engagement process um, through the Alliance. And we encourage um, any and all company uh, investors to not only join us um, in that in that collaborative engagement, um, but but to um, to uh, to be public actually around the use of the ranking digital rights um, index findings and and support for its recommendations. Oh, hopefully that was less than five minutes, but no. anyway. No, that was great, Lauren. And, um, you know, thanks for sharing your views on what you feel as well as an investor advocate um, that we need. And we need to continue to ask and expect from our technology company holdings. I mean, you know, technology companies are on the line, but so are investors in technology companies. And so, um, you know, important questions that you are throwing up for our investor community. And with that as well, I would like to ask our attendees to really, um, you know, use this opportunity to ask questions that you have for our panelists. Please uh, start to type your any questions that you have into the Q&A box um, so that when we move into that section, we can, um, start our questions um, as quickly as possible in the discussion going. And with that, um, you know, I wanted to say that today we are very fortunate uh, to have as well a com company panelist to give us really the company viewpoint. And we have uh, Carlo Manuel Drought, who is the head of responsible business and human rights at Telefonica. In this capacity, he's responsible for Telefonica's human rights policies and due diligence processes. Previously, he worked on sustainability and human rights issues in government and academia. He holds a PhD in public policy from the Hertie School of Governance. And with that, um, Carlos is well-placed to share with us today how Telefonica has tackled digital rights risks in their operations, using RDR Index as a roadmap, and how engaging with investors has also been an important part of the process in um, Telefonica really getting to where it is today at the top of the table, the ranking table with, um, the, with the ranking digital rights. So with that, um, over to you, Carlo, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, and uh, good afternoon from, from Madrid, Spain. Um, let me first uh, thank you, uh, the Human Rights Investor Alliance and uh, Ranking Digital Rights for, for organizing organizing this event and inviting us to to this um, to this webinar i would like to start by saying that uh, we at telefonica and uh, in particular in our in our sustainability human rights team um, we found the results of this year's rdr index encouraging encouraging uh, to continue our path uh, towards identifying preventing mitigating and remedying human rights impact uh, of our business activities, but we are well aware, of course, that uh, this, is, this is a path, yeah, so we are not there yet. There's still much work to do, uh, even though we rank uh, first for a second consecu consecutive year. Um, I, was, I was asked to talk about, about the utility of the RDR index for Telefonica, juxtaposing it with, with our more general human rights policy and our due diligence process to address human rights impacts. Uh, which is a bit of a challenge in five minutes, but I will try to be very concise and I'm happy to answer any remaining questions later, later on the panel. As for the utility of, of the um, RDR uh, index, um, as a sustainability human rights professional working in, in, in business, working in a company, to be honest, I cannot really overstate the, the relevance, the importance of, of the RDR um, index. Um, the index indicators, the annual feedback. I mean, all this helps us 
to define a clear roadmap uh, on where we as a firm need to go when it comes to the issue of digital rights. It helps us to continuously check also uh, where, um, whether we have to adapt our current practices and policies. Um, and it obviously also helps um, a great deal when it's not just us, the sustainability guys within a company that internally talk about the relevance of, of, of RDR, but also when, for example, our our colleagues from, from investor relations are approached and asked about RDR findings in investor calls. So the fact, for example, and you mentioned it earlier, um, that uh, the Human Rights uh, Investor Alliance explicitly mentioned uh, RDR in its statement on digital rights raises the impact of RDI or RDR on, on corporate behavior even further. Yeah? Um, having said that, obviously not all our human rights uh, activities engagement can be causally linked back to RDR uh, because there are also a few other internal and external drivers. But it is fair to say that, uh, yeah, that RDR and its excellent, excellent research team has greatly influenced our current human rights um, human rights approach. And um, a few words on, on, on this human rights approach, a uh, very quick summary. Um, in line with our, with our global human rights policy, we have a human rights due diligence process in place. And basically it all starts with our global human rights impact assessments that we conduct every three, four years with the help of external experts and in very close co um, consultation also with stakeholders, right holders, and the Basically, the objective of, of these global impact assessments is to identify what impacts of our activities, uh, what, what impacts our activities have on all existing human rights. And on this basis, identify those human rights issues that are most salient to our, to our business. And needless to say, uh, privacy, freedom of expression are always amongst uh, those, those most salient human rights issues. And based on these, on these global human rights, rights impact assessments and, and, the, and the salient human rights issues we identify, we then um, conduct annual human rights risks assessment in all our markets, in all our countries, because what we did is that we integrated our, we integrated human rights into our, our enterprise risk management as one item in our company risk map. So, which was quite a challenge uh, internally, uh, but we were able to integrate it next to other, yeah, the more typical financial risks. Um, so what this means in practice is that every year we check all our markets for potential human rights risks, which is of great help because this way, for example, we can capture um, regulatory changes in a given country or uh, new business activities we want to embark on that might negatively impact on human rights. Yeah. And in addition to these global human rights impact assessments, on the one hand, on these and these annual risk assessments that we integrated within our enterprise risk management, we also carry out thematic specific impacts assessment whenever we identify particular risk uh, concern. Yeah? And to provide a concrete example, and it's also an issue which have, has been elaborated on uh, in, in the previous uh, presentation, um, was the case of artificial intelligence. Yeah? As we all know that uh, the use of artificial intelligence can give rise to, to human rights challenges. And on the basis of the specific assessment we did on, on artificial intelligence, we developed an approach we, which we internally call human rights by design that we apply to new products and services. Also those obviously that involve artificial intelligence. Um, to be more precise, what we do is that we evaluate possible human rights impacts of new products and services already at the outset, outside of uh, outside of designing them. So, uh, what this means in practice is that product managers, developers, uh, after having taken a course on on ethics and artificial intelligence that we developed for for this purpose, they need to conduct a a self assessment um, via an online tool. Uh, in the design phase of new products and services with a view to identifying and, and addressing potential human rights impacts already at this early stage. And uh, human rights impacts that we have integrated in this question are obviously privacy, freedom of expression, but also other, other human rights issues such as uh, non-discrimination, um, environmental issues also, uh, uh, impact on vulnerable groups like children, etc. 
Uh, and if human rights issues uh, are identified after completion of the self-assessment, the product service in question is subject to a, how can I put it, to a more and more in-depth uh, analysis with the help of a team of human rights experts. This is also where our team comes into play. So, address, so to address potential human rights impacts in the further development of a, of a product of a service. So basically, this is just, just, just one example. And with that, I'll, I'll finish in a second um, of, of how we have changed a concrete process within the company on the basis first of, a globe, of the global assessment that identified a salient human rights issue, artificial intelligence, and then um, another one on, 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 on a specific uh, topic of, of, of concern. And there are other examples, not all of them related to privacy and freedom of expression, because we also have human rights challenges upstream in the supply chain when it comes to labor conditions uh, at suppliers, etc. cetera. But um, yeah, I hope I've been able to give you a very quick overview of our more general human rights policy, due diligence process, which I said, uh, has been influenced greatly by, by RDR and its evidence-based data-driven work and um, can be even more promoted, uh, obviously, if, uh, if an investors ask us um, at, at the highest level, at investor calls, ask our, our board, then uh, this also trickles down to the sustainability team. No, that's great, Carlo, and thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, it was uh, very interesting to hear as well the, the idea of, I mean, we've been talking about it, human rights by design that's been incorporated into Telefonica's processes um, and, you know, looking at that in, into product launches. So that's great. And also the role of um, civil society and experts in, in that organ in, in terms of driving that and uh, how investors can really help to trickle down that effect through, um, um, through their own um, articulation of these issues with their portfolio companies. And with that, you know, we have, we don't have that much time. So let's, let's kick off into the questions. Lauren, if you, question and answer session, Lauren, if you don't mind, can you uh, come back on board? And um, um, let's, let's go with the, with the one good question that's come up. And this is a little bit around regulation. And I, um, to what degree is the poor performance of U.S. companies as compared to, to non-U.S. companies a function of the, a, a function of regulation or the lack thereof? What, if any, lessons does that offer for regulatory reform? Uh, Rebecca, do you want to take that? Yeah. Sure, I'm happy to jump in, and and Jan might might have some some supplementary things. So so you know the the, the U.S. companies were less improved than than uh, on the most part than than companies from elsewhere. Even even though they, they're kind of hanging out at the, at, at the top of, of the the ranking, otherwise uh, at least for now. But but certainly the the lack of privacy um, regulation in the United States uh, is has prevented. The, the U.S. platforms, uh, many of them from, from, uh, from forcing, has, has, has failed to force U.S. platforms to do things that would uh, um, uh, raise their scores in the rankings that clearly they're not inclined to do um, voluntarily because um, some, some of these uh, disclosures or practices are, are just so core to their business model. So, uh, lack of a lack of a privacy law in the United States, also failure to to enforce anti antitrust um, uh, competition law, um, I think, also relates, although not as directly to the indicators. Um, but we're not we're not seeing uh, enough con competition around rights respecting uh, business models. Let's put it that way. Um, and and we we have seen, for example, Chinese companies scores that that did improve around um, data privacy, commercial data privacy practices, that was very much due to regulation in China, actually. Uh, and, and, and the GDPR in, in Europe has also had, a, had an impact. So, so that's pretty clear. But, but I also have to say, just, just regarding regulation, um, you know, in Europe, we have laws that, that are in train, <laughs> uh, both in, 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 at, at national level and at the EU level around mandatory due diligence, um, in increased requirements around non-financial reporting requirements, 
um, in Europe. We need that in the United States too. We need, we need the SEC to make companies um, disclose um, uh, material um, uh, information around ESG risks um, uh, in, in a smart way. Uh, also, just just the, the nature of what uh, uh, financial regulators in the United States allow and don't allow is, is having a lot of impact on investors' ability to hold companies accountable in other ways. So the dual class share structure means yes. that, you know, and the investor alliance and we're, and we're you know, we've, we've really been excited about working with members of the investor alliance on a number of shareholder proposals. And even those that have gotten, you know, a large percentage of, you know, non-privileged uh, votes, um, you know, can, can never get a majority because yes. uh, in a number of these companies, particularly Facebook, um, uh, the, the, the CEO um, holds uh, the, the majority control of the shares. And, and so a need for, for a range of, of regulatory reforms um, in the United States. I mean, the, the United States government actually needs to take responsibility for the impact that US-based platforms are having globally, and it has failed to do so. Thanks for that, Rebecca. Um, two words uh, to go with that. Um, there is a question that's kind of a mix between uh, um, um, from, from yourselves at RDR and also for Carlo. Uh, the question was really relating to internet shutdowns and the response of companies to government requests. Um, so one is, you know, does RDR's findings concerning companies, do you know, do you actually look at whether companies vet government's requests for information and what specific steps does a company like Telefonica take in this regard uh, in terms of responding to a government request? Maybe Carlo, you can jump in first. Oh, you're on mute, Carlo. Yeah. <laughs> it was clear that it was was to happen at least once during the call. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, on the, on this question, what we uh, do have, and Jan knows this very well, of course, uh, we have a global rule on requests made by competent authorities by law uh, enforcement agencies in place uh, at at the global level, which basically sets out a a uniform procedure for all company within the Telefonica group. Um, that they sh should follow when assessing and responding to, to government requests. Yeah? And, and to be very honest, obviously, this is always a, a, a also a very uh, a challenging task because on the one hand, you have to comply with the legal obligation in a given country. And then on the other hand, uh, we want uh, to, to respect fundamental uh, rights of the people affected. Um, and yeah, to strike this balance, we have uh, come up with this global rule and, um, and obviously re requests are rejected if they do not come from a competent authorities empowered by local uh, legislation. This is basically a, a, a must, yeah, or when they do not comply with legal processes established in the country in questions. But even if, say, if they do so, but might event, uh, eventually or potentially uh, impact negatively on human rights, what we then have is um, a specific procedure in place um, within the company where this, these cases are escalated um, to uh, yeah, higher levels of, 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 of the management to discuss on how to, how to deal with these uh, situations uh, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. And this is obviously not a very easy task uh, at times, uh, especially so if you are dealing with, uh, uh, yeah, uh, let's say, uh, less democratic uh, countries. Um, but um, this is something that we have, uh, we have established uh, this procedure. And um, at times also, uh, we try then to influence uh, the government in question through our membership in the GNI. So there are diff diff different strategies we can follow if these, if these situations arise. But um, uh, yeah, a short, short answer to this question is basically we have a, 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 a rule in place, a global rule, which sets out these this standard procedures which all companies within the group have, have to follow. And if there are controversial controversial request, then we have also a procedure in place to escalate it within the company. So to strike this balance between the legal obligation on the one hand and yeah, the respect for, for, for human rights on the other. 
Well, thank you for that, Carlos and I, uh, Carlo. And I know that we're actually just a minute off the hour, so I'm just going to close and thank everybody for really attending this uh, this call. And I'm, I'm sorry we didn't have more time for questions, but we had a lot of information to go, go through. So as investors in the tech sector, we really have that responsibility to hold our portfolio companies accountable to respect human rights of all users, affected communities and societies. And we want to see human rights due diligence at the center of managing human rights risks. Uh, what we want to say at, at this time is that we encourage investors to use the RDR data when engaging their companies. And the Investor Alliance is looking in, in order to build collective leverage of investors to engage with the ICT sector, we will be developing and coordinating an investor statement uh, to hold companies accountable. And we would you know, call on companies to demonstrate their commitment to protect and respect freedom of expression and privacy through strong policies, board oversight, and implementing human rights due diligence principles, and asking companies to be transparent and accountable on how they manage share and share users' data, and also on um, the development and deployment of algorithmic systems, targeted advertising, and really on their business model as well. So there's lots of questions that have come up and a lot of data for us to do. So thank you everybody for joining this call. And I hope, um, you know, this, uh, this discussion will help to feed further action. Again, thanks to all the panelists and uh, goodbye for now. So thanks, bye-bye. Right, thank you. Thank you, goodbye.